We'll now call this regular workshop meeting of Jacksonville City Council to order. Uh, Council, you have a copy of the agenda for tonight's meeting, and along with that, uh, there are uh, minutes from the March 21st, 2023 regular meeting, and uh, there's four consent items, one being an add-on, which will be 3A, which is a resolution supporting the NCDT project, W523U, which is the Western Boulevard Henderson Drive uh, project. All right, with that, uh, I'm going to entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All, right. All opposed. Um, so we're going to go on this, and at 6, we're going to probably take a break. We'll have Mr. Jackson uh, phone back in <coughs> at that time. After 6. He's like, after 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 six. Yes. So we'll begin tonight, and uh, let me say again, uh, this is a workshop and generally speaking we don't take action during workshops so uh, unless it's something that direly requires an actionable item which I don't foresee one but uh, anyway let's uh, stick to our, our, our methodology here. So we have our uh, first discussion tonight is Boys and Girls Club and we have Mr. Keith Williams, the Executive Director. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members and Mr. City Manager. We appreciate you guys um, giving us this opportunity. Many of you may know or may, have, may not know that the Boys and Girls Club switched names in January due to a unification. Um, <clears throat> you'll see those names come across, but it's the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southeastern North Carolina. So, uh, I'm at here, Mr. Josh. Can you run that, please? I'm just going to clap my hands and see if it works. Do I need to get you a Look at that. Okay. So uh, these are our lovely faces. These are actually our Anzo kids, but uh, you'll see those day in and day out at our sites. But uh, again, Boys and Girls Clubs of Southeastern North Carolina. Um, there you go. Our proposed site that, and when I say proposed site, uh, we have signed an MOU with Sandy Run Community and the Board of Directors. That location was going to be up and running March 1. Unfortunately, <clears throat> we had a little bit of an issue with um, permitting and a, a little bit of issues with engineering. But, um, you know, we have stepped out of faith. We're going to have that site up and running. Uh, currently, um, it's uh, Section 8 housing, as many of you know, there's 152 units there. We did our, a lot of homework in that, in that area. Uh, the schools that are served in that area, Belfort uh, Elementary, Jacksonville, Commons Middle School, and Northside High School. Worked very closely with Ms. Uh, Tricia Purcell Heath. Uh, she is the uh, finance person and the manager of Sandy Run Apartments. What we found out, <clears throat> obviously we're trying not to duplicate any services by any organizations. There's currently uh, less than 5% of the youth in that organization uh, or in that neighborhood that have any type of programming to include after school programming. Um, and you know, our closest provider is the city of Jacksonville Parks and Rec. Uh, the demographics over there, the total school age, there's 137 kids uh, six through 18 in Sandy Run. Uh, ages six to 12 is 88. Ages 13 to 18, there's 49. And our concentration in the beginning will be solely on K through five. Uh, obviously, we have to make sure that we're able to serve based on the, um, excuse me, the size of the building. We did some in-depth study, again, to make sure that we were not, as I said, duplicating, duplicating any services. There's only seven kids in Sandy Run that have any type of services. Uh, and we have a list of those. There's one that's being served at the child care um, at the Living Water Christian, one at Child Care Network, one at Teachable Moments, one at Love Center Child Care, one at XL8, one at Above and Beyond, one at Onslow uh, County Child Development Center. And there's also five additional children uh, that are being taken care of by a paid family member or a friend of, of the family. 
So of the 137 kids that live in Sandy Run, there's 12 kids in that whole community that have any type of, of, of service, which comes to the point that it is the most underserved and lowest income area in the city of Jackson. Um, right here, we want to show you just an overall a view of what we would be doing. If you look at the slide on the left, obviously the very bottom, that's Country Club Road. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know Sandy Run Community. There's one way in and one way out. And that third building on the left is the community center, Sandy Run Community Center. Uh, we're going to have some shared spaces there, obviously, with the community. Uh, there's a playground there. There's a basketball court that is lighted. <clears throat> and also, there's a very large field that um, we were looking at for other activities. Um, they also want to do uh, community gardens. Uh, they also want to do like, things like fruit trees, grapevines, and things that not only do our kids help tend, but it reaps the benefits for the community over there. Uh, so that's the outlay of the, of the um, community. This is just our quick, quick sketch of what the building looked like so that we could prove that the square footage would serve the number of kids that we need to serve. So um, that may not mean a whole lot to you guys uh, at the moment, but it's a 3,200 square foot building. Uh, the, the focus part of it, the large room would be for uh, general activities. And bottom lower right hand corner is a room for programming. Uh, which we would have as a computer lab for those kids to come into. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was on the next one, but that's the, that's the information there I just shared with you. These are our uh, club locations for the Boys and Girls Club right now. If you look in the top right-hand corner up here, we have six locations, which is the elementary schools. They're just outside of the city of Jacksonville. Down in the bottom are our four locations in New Hanover. And then the red star there is Sandy Run. One, we wanted to make sure we didn't duplicate our own services, but we also do not want to duplicate services um, that you know other organizations are maybe providing services. This is a, I say a win-win for everyone because of that community not being served currently. And anytime that we reach out to community partners, uh, I'd use First Bank for an example, we run financial literacy. Their, their bank is here in Jacksonville, they want to know first thing, where's your location in Jacksonville? You know, they want to be right here in the city. Um, so when we, we made an agreement with another organization to take a Clyde Irwin location, that took us out of the city. So we've been working with council members and, and the uh, board over at Sandy Rowan for quite a while now knowing that that was a need, and again, it, it serves their need, it serves our need, and it's, it's gonna be serving children that the city will not have to uh, worry about taking care of. This is the budget, um, if you can see that. <clears throat> what, what you're gonna see at the top, and, and I wanna say this, we went to their Christmas party, which was amazing. If you've never been, you need to go out and hang out at the Christmas party at Sandy Run. Uh, during December. But we went to that and we did a survey while we were there. We were there for, I think, six hours and it was just a blast. But we did a survey. If we opened that location, how many families thought that they would take advantage of our services? Now, this could change day in and day out because we started in January. I mean, it started in December. We have about 60 people, 60 members that think they would join. So we looked over here at an enrollment for our after-school program and our summer programs, we would look at about 60. We, knew, we used a number called ADA, which is average daily attendance. Based on our numbers uh, year in and year out, we would probably run about 50 per day. Uh, you never get 100% of everything. People are visiting grandmother, sicknesses, and all of those type things. So we're, we're expecting to run about 50 kids per day uh, in that unit. Our hours of operation, 2 to 6.30 for the after school program, uh, that is when we can get the most done. Uh, Boys and Girls Club after school programs, there's a lot of uh, instructional in there. Healthy habits, smart moves, uh, safe moves, uh, safe girls, uh, financial literacy. We do a lot of things educational 
uh, and then we do our playing. But otherwise, we do a lot of educational. So we want to make sure we have time to do that. During the summer, we were looking at a 10 to 4 program, and that was solely on the uh, Sandy Run board. Uh, they just said, I'm telling you, you're on site, getting the kids out of bed. We normally start our sites at 7, end at 6, but they're going to be on location. So they said, I just think you're going to be safe to do a 10 to 4 uh, because if you're going to start the programs at 9, you're not going to have many kiddos there. <laughs> they're still sleeping in. This is uh, the budget on the bottom. Now, we'll say we were seeking $1,200. Um, that is, we're not going to charge any kid. Uh, I want to make that clear. We're not charging any family or any child anything to go to these programs. However, we were going to do an enrollment fee for these 60 of only $20. Uh, but since this budget was put together, I've already had a sponsor that's come forth and has paid that $1,200. So we just felt like a little buy-in to get them there. Uh, and this still will be a buy-in situation. We will let them know uh, that your initial fee was $20 just for your membership. However, we even have that covered. Uh, grants, uh, we were seeking $45,000. And what we're asking from the city of Jacksonville uh, is a $25,000 grant. And we will get the rest of that from HHS. Uh, Health and Human Services pays us based on our ADA. Uh, so they will, they will pick up the difference in that. Even before our debt doors are open, we already have private donations of $34,275. Uh, the minute we started talking about those programs, uh, coming in and doing things for that uh, underserved community, uh, we received quite a bit of money right off the bat, and that gives us our total revenue that we would need of $80,475. Now, our expenditures at the bottom, the total wages, $61,940. And I will say this is based on a 1 to 10 ratio. We normally run our sites at a 1 to 15 ratio. We felt like because a kid lives across the street, he might walk out the door inside, he's going home. Uh, we want more eyes on those children. So we're running an even tighter ratio of 1 to 10. Uh, so for every 10 kids in there, we will have an adult. Um, taxes and benefits, 6190 Program supplies, these are things that we get traditionally um, that from Boys and Girls Clubs of America, $3,250. Transportation, um, I am pleased to say that an organization has stepped up and uh, will be buying a bus for Sandy Run. Uh, and my dream there is that they get to see something other than coming to Sandy Run, getting on the bus, coming back to Sandy Run. And I painted a picture as simple as many of those people, those young kids will never feed a duck with a loaf of bread. Just to get them to a duck pond, get them to a ball game, get them, get them out to ride to see Christmas decorations at the holiday, things that they will never see otherwise. So uh, we're on a project right now that an uh, organization is purchasing a bus for Sandy Run alone. It will sit there and it'll say Boys and Girls Club Sandy Run location. Transportation, obviously, is going to be the fuel. Occupancy, Sandy Run has been so good to us uh, to basically get everything up fitted. There's no charge to us. However, if a child kicks a hole through the sheetrock or messes up, you know, the paint gets messed up, we want to have a little fun there that we can keep their building looking top notch. So we'll be able to go back and, and do some painting and anything needs to be done. Staff costs are our staff t-shirts. All of our staff wear noticeable shirts that says staff, boys and girls clubs of Southeastern North Carolina. They're a certain color. If a parent comes in or if a child comes in, they know how to identify our staff members. Food program, we give them a healthy a snack once after school. And during the summer, they'll get morning and afternoon. And also when we run our summer programs, uh, we also have a partnership with Oslo County Schools that the lunches will be provided. So, again, no charge to the kids, whether it's snacks or whether it's lunches. Technology, there's always going to be something that's going to go bad. Even though uh, there's internet there at the Sandy Run Community Center, you, you're always going to need something. A, a computer's going to go bad. You're going to need modems. You're going to need just different things. So we're going to put a little bit of money in there. Uh, and, again... 
in dealing with Mr. Evans, there's there's nothing that we need up front. That building is they they've done a great job of maintaining it. Uh, super excited. Other than two changes that are having to be made, uh, just a permitting and a coding thing uh, that will be taken care of. So that brings our total expenses to eighty thousand four seventy five, and obviously. Uh, it's a, it's a nonprofit, so there's no net income. Okay, I, I will say this last thing is, you know, Boys and Girls Club, Southeastern North Carolina, we are asking and, and seeking your support. Uh, they are our children. They're, they're Jacksonville's children uh, for $25,000. And again, it is the most underserved and, most, and the lowest income uh, area here in the city of Jacksonville. And we are willing to step up and make sure that those kids have a brighter future. So if anyone has any questions for me or comments, Council? I do. Yes, ma'am. With the data that you presented, how, uh, what's the date of that data? That was November. This past November yes, of 22? We started working on that in, in high hopes that it was going to be open in March. That was our projected day. So we could get a couple of uh, months under our belt before we start summer camp. And we did some extensive research with Miss uh, Patri Miss Tricia over there at Sandy Run. Uh, she told me there's not a whole lot of fluctuation. They're not in and out, and people don't stay short term. We may see those numbers fluctuate, but in general, these are some of the numbers she's run uh, from quite a few years. What's the max um, amount of kids you can have? We work with the city on that, and we feel like 60 is going to be safe. We can. We would need to reach out to the fire department, obviously, to make sure. But when we took that survey, 60, because they're not all in the one room at the same time. They're going to be in the programming room, the technology room. Some will be at the playground, uh, you know, and then there's another room in the back that we have that we have access to as well. Uh, and then there is a fenced-in playground in the back for the smaller kids. So it's not, they'll never really be in the same room all at one time. So try to keep those kids spread out from you're talking about K through five, you know, five year olds are too cool to be around the kindergartners and they like to pick on them. So yeah. we just we keep them spread out. But there's plenty of room for the 60. And we, I said it would be a great problem to have if we have 75 that want to enroll. Um, you know, we'll work it out. And uh, I, I just want to leave one last comment. We've also partnered with the, the board over there that even though we'll start later in the afternoon, 2, 2.30, whenever the kids get out, we're going to provide staffing from 12 o'clock until. And what our hopes is, is there is that we can teach parents, uh, older siblings or anybody, how to do resumes, applications, interviews, and things that would help make them uh, a better applicant when they're out applying, uh, you know, throughout the community for, for better jobs. So we want to, we don't want to just be working with the kids. We want to be community partners to help the entire community. Is this create new jobs too for staff or are you just moving people around? We, well, we will if we get that because we do have a program uh, for the youth development. If we have some that wants to get on, on board, uh, already had three Sandy Run applicants come in from the community. So if we can employ people over there, if it's within their guidelines, we also want to make sure that we have some people on site. Uh, they've already been vetted to live there because we go through extra vetting for the Boys and Girls Club. But uh, we would love to have people on site. They know those kids. I'm going to tell your mama, you know, yeah. straighten you out. So those are good people to have on board. Yeah. Have you also looked with the Department of Education because there are grants with each state having a national alliance um, after school program, the mm -hmm. grants through the Department of Education? Have you applied for those grants? I would say at this point, no. You um, might want to. I, I absolutely have brought some information back for the National League of Cities Council. Okay. I was part of their um, after school advisory luncheon and um, I have plenty of information I can share with you because yes, I think some of those monies from the state as well as the federal government um, might be of interest to you. Yes ma'am, please, thank you. And my last question, what wraparound services are you also going to provide for the students? Because my concern is that the 13 through the 18 year olds can be the latchkey kids and I kind of wonder about them not having a structured summer. So. What type of wraparound services will your group be able to provide? 
We have four other locations, um, and we have promised them that we would try to serve as many on-site as possible, and we'll have to do that, obviously, by code. But we have four other locations, and our plan is to bust those. Our nearest location is Newbridge Middle, which is just around the corner, so we have saved slots there for other kids that want to enroll. Obviously, we don't want to have 13, 14, 15-year-old kids in there with K-5. through Absolutely. Uh, that would be... I'm not saying dangerous, but it would be mighty boring for those older ones. So we will Social take development those. development is not appropriate. Yes, ma'am. We would take those to, uh, if they want to go to Ridgelands, if they want to go to Sand Ridge or Newbridge Middle. So we have those locations. And also Clearview will be a summer camp. So we have four other locations. You also mentioned something about this community being underserved. And the first thing that popped into my mind was about civic affairs, because civic affairs is all yes, about education. So I'm wondering, well, we have a meeting on Thursday, how the civic affair members can, you know, we we have the Beirut Memorial, we have the Lejeune Gardens, we have the Montfort Point Museums, some of these places that these kids have never been. So what is the likelihood of strategically planning trips for these underserved students to, to look at a part of their county mm -hmm. and a city in which they are affiliated with to learn more about it? Yes, ma'am. The likelihood is 100%. Um, I would love to take, and, and we have that bus for a reason to bus those kids out so we have access to two buses uh, if we have something of that nature i would love to bus them there because again that's stuff they're never going to see they're never going to be involved in and we want those kids to be the future civic uh you know civic affairs people military affairs whatever they are council members we want them to be involved and, and they're not going to get there if they don't see it in action they don't see a reason to want to be involved so uh we want that uh, that's one thing that I've uh, I've got a site director that's going to be at that site, 21 year retired Marine and just grew up in a boys and girls club. He's ready to go. He's worked with me for four years. He is super excited. Um, he he does a lot of work right now with other organizations that are working in Sandy Run, and it's that's going to be a win win for all of us. And he's already mentoring those parents uh, on resumes, applications, and things of that nature. So. Uh, that's what we want to do is get them out of that so it's not a vicious cycle that uh, they've always seen all their life of just feeling like they have to stay there because they don't. They can make a better way, and we want to help them. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. <laughs> As long as it's positive, it's positive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would anyone like any hard copies? Are they all fat? Yeah, we're, I'm old fashioned. I like the hard copies. like that bedtime reading, passing on down. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, Mr. Sewell. How you doing? Good, Doctor. How are you? We can share. I've got one. I got plenty. We just like them back. Um, at the end, we present to the um, county and then to the school board. So, but I'm Billy Sewell, and thank you so much for the opportunity for our New River YMCA to meet with you. And um, I'd like to acknowledge um, other board members that are with us, certainly Steve Wangren and then Reverend Churchwell and then Don Rochelle and Chief Unero behind us. So thank you all for the time. And <clears throat> this is a great collaboration um, to this point um, that we've been able to work through a feasibility study with um, a pool facility company out of Georgia, Architect Unlimited and Aquatics um, H2O. And we've had great successful conversations with the legislature um, in April and then certainly Congressman Murphy's office and certainly we have already had a conversation with um, the school board. We go back and meet with them on 425 and then certainly um, this is our second meeting with some and most of y'all. And certainly, um, we wind up meeting with the commissioners um, this coming Monday. So, as 
some of you know and part of you know, you know, just the reason and the whys of um, this talks about why we need a pool facility and certainly um, in collaboration with the school system. And then this materialized in November and into December. Um, our new YMCA has just signed a lease um, to purchase the River Life Building at 1940 Gum Branch Road. And we'll take this over the first week of May. And it's ironic that Steve and I and Don were standing in this um, lot out to the left and said, you know, I wonder if this pool would fit right over here, you know, towards Cardinal Village. And if you flip to the next page, you'll see that's the Lord's work, that it's more than a coincidence that it fits nicely. <clears throat> so from our perspective, as we have talked about, and we'll go through in a minute, our goal is to present to each of our partners, city, county, and school system, and certainly we've already done that with the legislature, and certainly uh, Representative Shepard with the Speaker's Office, and then Senator Lazaro with the Speaker Pro Tem Berger, and we have been asked by the legislature to get the memorandums of understanding from each of our three county partners and then be able to present that back to the legislature in late May, early June, thus that that would trigger the $5 million ask, which we'll show you in a minute how that plays into the puzzle of a public-private partnership. Just, just, I, I just want to walk back just a step. So. If you're looking at this site and you see the existing building, which is the white roof and the pool facility, which is the, the gray roof, if you will, uh, the plan is, uh, thanks to your support with helping us begin the Y in 2018 on Cheney Avenue, we've been able to serve thousands of kids and, and, and our estimate today is we're probably reaching and touching close to 2,000 kids on a daily basis. As, as a why between after school before school programs, the 21st century grant program at Clyde Irwin Elementary, and then summer camps and things like that. It has allowed us to grow. And, and you see the pool site, and that's what we're here to talk about is the pool. But we want you to know that that River Our Life existing facility will be an expansion of the Y as well, serving uh, youth primarily in that area through uh, before school or preschool homeschooling efforts and the sanctuary in the center of it is a perfect 60 by 100 rectangle that'll be able to be turned into multi-purpose area, uh, gym space, other activity type space, and uh, administrative space will be in the church offices, which will allow us to take Cheney Avenue down here and turn it into an actual uh, child care center for what we think serves this area well for government workers primarily that are located in this area. So not only does this pool site work well, it, it fits the area and the community to, to uh, help continue to build youth programs and get kids in, in, in a great setting. And as you flip, you'll see the two pool facility with the competition and school use and certainly um, we anticipate YMCA swim teams using the left and then the, the pool on the right would be recreation and rehab facility and then as you see the, the footnotes down on the left in the legend and that brings to the conversation that we have had three successful conversations with the VA and part of the reason for the a little bit larger size facility they are asking for 2,500 square feet for OT, PT, physical therapy, and pool use, and they also want immediate gym use, which parlays into the point of 10 yards away in the River Life Building, and that 13,000 square feet is that 7,000 square foot uh, gym space will turn into multi-purpose gym space. So this will really work hand in glove, and you see the, the D in the bottom would um, be the VA center, and the G on the left would 
you know, be birthday parties for Logan's children and my children. And um, you see on the previous page where there's a splash pad, and that also gives us extra room for additional splash pad or outdoor pool facility going into the future. So um, you see the overlay on the next page. And then going one step further, um, you will see, you know, certainly the expansion, the challenge, the solution, the impact, um, certainly how it lays out in the dollars. The legislative ask of five million, county schools at three million, certainly the city of Jacksonville at three, and then Onslow County, and then um, our wide board and our um, why partners plan the race between, we think of between a million and a million two that would go towards a full wall share fund because, you know, somewhere in this, and you'll see it in the next page, there's anticipated revenue on an annual basis for the rental and the use of the pool facilities, and then there's the expense, and we think it'll take three to four years where, that, where there may be a break even, and we anticipate using those, that million dollars so that we don't have to come back to the city or the county or any partner for four or five years and then it hopes for a long while because we'll be working out of that million dollars um so the next page shows you know there would be a 300 a 600 and a you know a nine hundred thousand dollar expense um in revenue versus expense the next page that you're looking at um also i may have skipped the point shows the um potential expense. We think that there's between a 13 and a $14 million construction cost, um, and those numbers are about 60 days old as of the middle of February, and then um, there is anticipated number in there for, for land cost as well um, that will be able to lower the cost of the facility from a $2.7 million purchase that's leased to the YMCA, so in turn, the from a landlord perspective to the tenant perspective, if the YMCA wants to buy the facility from the landlord group, then it will be $1 million less, 1.7 versus the cost at purchase of 2.7. So it'll just make the flow through and all the pieces of the economics so much easier on the Y so we can perform more services. Then our ask is a memorandum of understanding and, and speaking with some of you and certainly the mayor is um, the ask of $3 million over two budget cycles. Um, the first dollar is coming before and by the fourth quarter of this year and another million and a half coming by the end of the second or third quarter of next year so that with that, those anticipated dollars flowing with all four partnerships then we would be able to start construction sometime in the first quarter of 2024. So we anticipate the cost of, of site work to be minimal because we're on a flat site and um, curb and gutter. We do know that we'll have other expected costs, um, not unusual to development costs, um, but we're in the middle of great usage and hub. Um, on both sides and in, in all four corners or not all four uh, potential land continuances and the bright spot is thanks to y'all the city will be able to use the cut through through the city park so that'll allow you know mothers or whoever <coughs> driving children and other folks to use it that they can turn right and go out to western or find the the stoplight from the Williamsburg Plantation Shopping Center, which will, you know, hopefully be a, a safety um, enhancement versus turn left on Gum Branch. So, what we would anticipate after we would get a memorandum of understanding from the city is coming back in May and June, and <clears throat> basically have because you know we understand. The city's going to be represented with John, the county will be represented with Brett the Sounds, the school system with Mr. Urban, and then our YMCA is how, how do we create a law shared document that's fair to all parties? That we, you know, we know that at some point 
it's you know it's like an air conditioner. Only Logan knows when the compressor is going to go out. You know, so from our perspective, when you know when will a motor on one of these two you know half a million to a million dollar machines that works these two pool facilities? So that's the only thing that we that we know that we've got to have clear language where it's fair to all concerned. Um, so we recognize that and. We're, we're prepared to compromise in, in ways that's going to work for everybody. But as we know and we see whether, you know, I went to Parkwood, Northwoods Park, and Jacksonville, and I was not on any swim team that there was. They didn't have one to offer. Well, going forward in 2025 or 26, I think every high school and junior high should have the opportunity for a swim team. The Nearville YMCA will have swim teams. And... There's probably a Mark Spitz in Onslow County. We just don't know it yet. So there's hope and opportunity here. But as my daddy was a school principal, said if you can keep a, a young person busy from the time school gets out until he goes to bed and on Saturday and Sunday, there's hope that he won't spend his week on Court Street. So I can only say that from a perspective that this building will be open 364 days a year and the River of Life, New River YMCA, We'll have an opportunity 364 or 365 days that we can change young people's lives or have an opportunity that it can be a senior center in some aspects. And I know that they may be able to and want to use the, the pool facility. So this is a citywide, countywide, maybe a multi-county use facility that for low cost and no cost, this will be a great opportunity that we've never had in Onslow County. So... I'm trying to stay within your time frame, Mr. Sure. State Manager. So I, I would I would add that this the Y has a long history of being able to own and operate pools and and, and the experience. Billy and I don't have the experience, nor does anybody on our team, but we will find that experience. And the Y brings resources from across the country on how to operate a pool facility. But this is the this proposal is we will run it. But it's a community asset for all to enjoy. It, it, the, if you're a county resident, you'll have the opportunity to use this pool facility. Obviously, in order for all you know, for this to work, everybody would have to pay some sort of fee uh, on a daily basis, or they could be a monthly member, or things like that. That's all to be determined as to what those rates are. But it's a community asset. It's an asset that for that is. With the city and the county and the school board investing in it, and it, it, it needs to be just that. Uh, uh, but we will bring the Y leadership and the Y uh, uh, ownership of, of operating it to the table. I think we can do that well. And we have several YMCA's within two hours, whether it's Wilmington, Goldsboro, Wilson, um, Rocky Mount. Jane has worked in two different facilities where she had one and two pool and five pool facilities. So. Um, we, we recognize that no other entity in our partnership wants that liability. And we're, we're comfortable, and we, and we, the YMCA, have that experience. So that's the burden that we'll take and, and have a comfort zone with all that because we know that it's a provided service. It, you know, as the grocery store people might call it, it may be a loss leader, but it's a, it's a needed performance for water safety and for... The, all the aspects of, of, you know, infant all the way to, to seniors that I think our community and our county and our city needs. And uh, we're ready for it. Um, so with that, I open the table for any questions. Quick question. What, what was your estimate of the annual expense of operation? The first year, Sammy, at the bottom of the, I'll, I'll try and get to that page. But it, it, we estimate it's about a half a million dollars the first year, uh, right there at the bottom, and then seven fifty, and then nine hundred. Oh, okay, I see. It now. First, second, and third year, you see what our projected revenues are. And this didn't just come out off there. We, we our consultant in this feasibility study put this together for us, and um, you know, Billy didn't mention but the, the legislature was so gracious to give us or, or gave us five hundred thousand dollars in last year's budget cycle to do the feasibility study and to begin the process of doing some design phase and that type of stuff so we got a little bit of, a little bit of legroom and, and buy-in already from from the legislature 
last year. So uh, we believe that we can go back to the speaker with uh, and, and, and our representatives with uh, a member of a memorandum of understanding from all three parties here in Alonzo County, the city of Jackson, Alonzo County, and, and the school board that that we can be successful in getting a match, if you will, of, of those committed dollars. And it's it's an all or nothing and our best opportunity. I mean, if, if you do a memorandum of understanding, it can specifically state that if the school board and the, the commissioners or everybody has to be in agreement to doing this uh, for it to be done. It won't be just, it's gotta be an all or none. We we'll try to get an answer. <coughs> what, are, what are you done on? We told the speaker's office and, and the more that we would bring in they want to get out by July 4th, so they want to have their budget ratified, ratified and completed sometime the last two weeks of June. So I told him by the end of the first week of June, I would be bringing him three to four memorandums of understanding. I hey, just out of curiosity, are the earmarks tied to whether or not Governor Cooper signs the budget or not? I, I just, just out of curiosity. Expansion of Medicaid, I understand. Oh, so Yes, sir. That's what I was told by yeah. um, both Shepard, Berger, Moore, and um, uh, Lazaro. I've lived in Jacksonville long enough that I don't remember when there was a pool at the J.T. Kerr Recreation Center downtown. Do you remember that? Okay. okay. <laughs> However, I do specifically remember when there was a swimming pool. Um, I don't remember when it was built, but I remember there used to be a swimming pool in front of Northwoods Recreation Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Years ago, now it's been filled in. My question to the both of you, have you considered bringing the federal government into this partnership. Now, here's the reason that I'm asking you this. When I attended the North Carolina MAC meeting back in February of this year, there is something that's called the North Carolina Community Infrastructure Program. And specifically, there is something known as the Defense Community Infrastructure Program known as DSIP. I'll send this information to you in which it is designed to address deficiencies in community infrastructures that are supportive of the military installation, enhanced military installation value, provide installation resilience, and provide military families with the quality of life. And under the Secretary of Defense, this program can make grants, conclude cooperative agreements, and supplemental funds up to a granding source of $90 million. So just in case, here's something that I wanna share with the public that previous DCEP grant awards that specifically came to Onslow County and the city of Jacksonville, Camp Lejeune and Ellis Airport received $2 million for um, the runway renovation and the city of Jacksonville received a million dollars for Jack and Yet. So I'm wondering now, since we have the support of your legislatures thus far, maybe the next step is to seek out these fundings with the federal governments because their pocketbooks is a little bit more bigger than ours. And because we have a military installation directly aside to our cities, bringing in the federal government might help because According to this summary, your proposals have to be shovel ready, located off a military installation. So it's worthwhile looking into. Good point. We have great, a great point. And we have a request into Congressman Murphy's office and to um, Senator Tillis's office. And there were and <clears throat> Congressman Murphy mentioned that there is a pot of money because he sits on Veterans Affairs. I don't know if it ties back specifically. Well, this came out of the North Carolina MAC, which I'm a member of the, mm -hmm. yes, sir. We, 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 have, we have had, we, didn't, yeah, we, don't, we, have, we have a request in that actually has to go through Tillis's office, mm -hmm. but Congress Mur Congressman Murphy has written a letter of support okay. for our facility that was uh, to be submitted by, I think, the end of March uh, to, to and Tillis would, 
submit it in in the earmark program. Uh, so we do have that. We do have something submitted there. But I don't, I don't I, Angela, I'm not sure, sure that it's through this program. Obviously, we need to also explore this program um, because any additional monies we can get, uh, we need the commitment to do this, but any additional monies that then can just go into that reserve account or, or however it needed to be appropriated. We, can you send that information? Mm -hmm. I sure will. Mm -hmm. But we do. We did get a letter of support from Congressman Murphy's office sent to Senator Tillis's office uh, to to try and get in this round their budget too. It had to be in my March thirty first, or, or we miss. But if you don't get it this time, we can always go back this time next year uh, for, the, for the same ask. Well, it seems like that would tie together well with service in VA. Yeah. Three years. So we have a meeting Thursday about twelve o'clock with. Um, Adam Caldwell with Senator Tillis's office mm -hmm. um, to mm -hmm. go go one step further and then ask well, we'll ask certainly this this pointed idea of uh, good thought. So it, let's just say that you added you know United States government as a fifth partner down here. It could be that we figure that out by the time we start construction or somewhere in that. And we get, we're anticipating an 18 month construction or so then I hate that I hate to go as far as to say we'll give your money back but <laughs> if there's a good partnership and there are dollars left then we're all open hands and we're going to share and recognize that the the dollars that come are going to go into a controlled account that have to have debits and credits before the money can come out and certainly if all parties need to approve it so be it so um, i know the five hundred thousand that's sitting at the county and then most likely the state will send their four or five million dollars to that same account with the county and those funds have to follow that same process so no worries um we're excited for this opportunity and we feel very comfortable that it's real doable, um, but it's, you know, I don't think these funds are always going to be available to legislature. And I don't know that the school system or the county that they'll always be available. So I think the iron's hot and the desire's here. Let's give something to the 210,000 folks in Onslow County in the next 12 months. So thank you for the opportunity to present. Questions, Thomas? Thank you. 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 Mr. Sewell, I'll give you a telephone call. I'll get this information. Yes, yes, thank you. Mr. Wayne, do I have your card? Do you have one? I know how to get in contact with you. Thank you. Look at all that money. I don't want to get a person out of the bank. I like cash. I definitely get a card, credit card stuff. Cash gets me places sometimes. No, I had done that yet. Well, I didn't ask on it. <laughs> Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, yeah. 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 Y
It's all about the children. It's all about the children today. Right. We got a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Jennifer's not here today. No. no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. What? Are you at the bunker? No, no. I got it. All right, we're ready. I've got the clicker. <laughs> Watch out. All right. okay. Mayor, council, and staff, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to update you on our community work the status of our permanent home, and an invitation to you to be a part of the legacy of one place with an award of a capital investment. My name is Dawn Rochelle, and I have the honor of serving as the Chief Executive Officer in One Place. And alongside me this evening is Amory Raymond, our Chief Advancement Officer. Amory and I have presented to you several times over the years as community needs have emerged. The Council has served as leaders for our community, in creating the Suicide Task Force in 2015 and the Child Abuse Task Force in 2018. When issues are presented, you respond by collaboration, thoughtful responses, and servant leadership. For that, we are thankful for your belief in what we do today and for what we see for tomorrow for our children and our community. We are guided by the questions of what are the problems we are uniquely positioned to solve and what does the community depend on us to do? Sitting around the table in 2018, we were approaching our 20th year as a nonprofit and just having a conversation. What are we here for and what are we known for? We are proud of our work and you're always called to do more. Knowing that preventing and ending child abuse will likely not end in our lifetime, how can we ensure that one place will continue to exist to serve our children and our families long past us? We know that rent of our current space was a large expenditure and still is, and we knew that the space was not flexible currently or would meet our needs long term. So we began an exhaustive programming process in 2019 to become more clear on our space needs, our focus on healing, and where we needed help to serve more. This has driven us to our need for expansion, and we are thankful to the city and securing the piece of property in the Jacksonville Commons. Knowing that we hold the responsibility of creating resilience for children when they have been sexually or physically assaulted, knowing that we must ensure the most trained staff, knowing that we must support the expansion of early childhood in the youngest community in North Carolina, knowing that we must create responsive trauma-informed child mental health services for child victims, and knowing that we must support our ever-growing military population led us to the creation of a concept of a state-of-the-art modern facility that is created with the child, family, and community partners in mind. You see in front of you a concept design of our state-of-the-art home that has been designed to restore hope in families that have been hurt, fractured, and feel disconnected. Every design element has used emerging science to support children and families and community partners exposed to traumatic events. Think about what you need and what you look for when you're going for medical and mental health treatment. As humans, we look for spaces where we feel safe, and through research, we know that environment matters. The North Carolina General Assembly, through the leadership of our representative, Phil Shepard, and our Senator, Michael Lazara, made an investment in this vision in 2021. The State Employees Credit Union Foundation made their first substantial capital gift ever in Onslow County to name our permanent home, the Psyche Hope Center, in 2022. These investments propelled the project forward and we will break ground with your help this summer. To understand more of how the service will be delivered, um, we will focus on the areas of impact that this project allows us to expand. The area to the left in green on your screen represents our nationally accredited Child Advocacy Center that will include two separate suites to enable multiple children to receive services simultaneously. The expansion from 2,100 to 5,200 square feet will reduce wait time for services and potential evidence collection. The area in light orange on your bottom of the screen on the right side is the child mental health space. 
This space will provide over 1,400 square feet for multiple mental health providers to ensure that each child victim receiving Child Advocacy Center services has access to timely on-site mental health support. The area in the middle in white is collaborative space to extend our capacity for group mental health care and collaborative workspace for all of our multidisciplinary partners. The need for resilience, mental health, and early care and education training is not diminishing. The area in pink to the back of the top of the screen will be a hub for statewide and regional events, trainings, and conferences. We need to expand our community capacity for large educational events. This area is also configured for disaster response if needed in our community. Child abuse changes the course of a child's life. <clears throat> child abuse is a community responsibility. Our community came together in 2005 to do what's best for our children. All elected leaders and agency heads agreed that a child advocacy center was needed in our community to respond to the high rates of abuse and neglect. The local district attorney and community leaders recommended that one place host the child advocacy center. We began serving child abuse victims in 2010. Since then, we have evaluated more than 3,400 local children and thousands of parents and caregivers. Our Child Advocacy Center is the sole entity in Oslo County who can deliver the entire service needed to comprehensively evaluate a child for abuse. One Place is the hub of coordinated response working with all child serving agencies and every civilian and military law enforcement agency. At any given time, the Child Advocacy Center has about 1,000 children with open cases awaiting justice through the courts and in need of additional services. Sadly, the need has not lessened. I want you to imagine yourself as a parent when you learn that your child has been raped or sexually assaulted. Wouldn't you want your child to be seen immediately in your own community and by a team of highly trained professionals engaged in evidence-based practices? One place employs the only two rostered and credentialed child abuse medical experts in Oslo County. They, along with our trained child forensic interviewers and victim advocates, thoughtfully talk with the child and perform a comprehensive medical exam and lab test to ensure the child is safe and healthy. One place does this in partnership and collaboration with Child Protective Services and military and civilian law enforcement who are physically on site with us throughout the entire process. Working so closely together reduces the number of times child victims must tell their story, which lessens trauma. It also allows for case consultation and planning to occur as a team. This ensures that all responding agencies are on the same page. At our Child Advocacy Center, we have evaluated a 12-day-old victim of physical abuse a sexual abuse victim turning 18 the following day, and all other ages in between, is what we agreed to do. Law enforcement closes their cases once criminal charges have been filed. Child Protective Services closes their cases once they determine the risk has been reduced or eliminated. One place becomes the constant for the child and family. One Place continues to support child victims throughout the entire and lengthy journey preceding criminal court. It is not unusual for a court case to take two to four years after the charges are filed. When the time finally arrives for court, our trained staff sit with them during a very scary and highly emotional time. Imagine being a child testifying in front of your offender especially since 92% of the time the offender is known to them. The case is strengthened with our team providing expert testimony in the child's trial. The entire process from beginning to end is both proven and successful. Our own district attorney, Ernie Lee, will tell you that having a child advocacy center has doubled the increase in the successful prosecution rate. The piece that is missing is accessible and comprehensive child mental health services. Ask any parent that has tried to schedule an appointment. Best practice requires certain therapy modalities, and we currently only have two providers that see our children. So add the numbers together. 
We have over 300 children a year that are evaluated for sexual or physical abuse. It takes three to four years to go to court. We are there to support the service. We have 800 to 1,000 children at any given time that need specialized child mental health services so that the havoc that adverse childhood experience does not impact the future of this child. When it does, we all pay more. Again, our new space will allow state-of-the-art technology to offer opportunities for virtual, in-person, hybrid training, conferences, and regional and statewide meetings. By educating our community and connecting professionals and businesses with vital resources, we can create a more responsive community that provides a strong foundation for all children and families and creates lasting positive change. For 25 years, One Place has developed professional level jobs for our community. Today, we employ 60 full-time positions. This project will add a projected 25 new professional level staff that bring desperately needed skills for our children. The upper half of the story building is pretty much what we currently have in administrative and operations support in a collaborative work environment for our early education services that support our child care workforce and our child care centers and preschool classrooms and public schools. Our permanent home concept was approved by our board of directors, some of whom are in the room this evening, in March of 2020, right before life as we knew it shifted. We are all aware of the cost escalation that has happened. We are all aware of supply chain issues. And we are all aware that we continue to grow as a community with the highest birth rate per capita in North Carolina, we have the fastest growing veteran population centers, shifts in military personnel, and I can go on and on with what you already know. The capital construction costs have increased since 2020 in original projections. We are blessed with a great team of consultants, engineers, owners rep, and our partnership with the SECU Foundation to help us in continuing to value engineer this project to keep costs under control while balancing increasing need and maintaining the original vision. As you can see by our timeline, we have moved quickly since the investment of the General Assembly and the SECU Foundation. Two years from today, we will be at a ribbon cutting with your help. Our current plan to a debt-free facility is outlined on this slide. Again, we are blessed to be almost halfway to goal for total project cost and 59% to goal of just looking at projected construction cost. In order to provide the services, we prefer not to borrow funds. We need your help in a capital investment so that our services dollars that we currently spend in rent can create cash flow to ensure sustainability. When you invest in children, we know that every dollar has a return on investment of $7. We are asking for $1 million to be invested by the city. With our project schedule, ideally this would be done over two to three years. So if I were in your shoes, I would want to know how will one place sustain this expansion? Through thoughtful guidance from foundation representatives, consultants, attorneys, and more, we have structured our organization to prepare for our future. We bring over $12 million of state, federal, and private revenue to Osmond County year after year. This revenue cannot be used for capital projects, and 95% is for restricted use, meaning money in for specific purposes like funding 759 preschool slots for four-year-olds, or the over 15,000 children a year we support through the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. When we move into this space, we will still be the same one place that has been a good steward of the funds that we have managed into this community for over 25 years with an average administrative overhead of 7% or less. We continue to expand our capacity to grow revenue for services because we are invested in this ever-growing community. But we need your help in a capital investment to ensure that services continue long past all of us so that our children and their children are prepared for their future when we are all sitting in our rocking chairs, this investment we are asking you for will still be paying dividends and making our community safer and more resilient. I, along with our boards of directors, our project partners, and current investors in this project, say thank you for this opportunity to share this with you.
some questions. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Unless somebody would like it. We're going to go ahead and take a recess uh, and come back shortly. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm calling in from the 2023 Reentry Conference in Charlotte hosted by the North Carolina Department of Adult Corrections. From all around our state of South Carolina, um, we have over 512 participants. This includes uh, Secretary Todd Ishii from the Department of Adult Corrections. We also had the governor here earlier. We have law enforcement from around this area, city and county management, state agencies, and community organizations all dedicated to the change of lives through services dedicated to the success of returning citizens. On the screen, you see uh, an announcement for our upcoming simulation, reentry simulation. It's going to be held in Carteret County, and it's actually in a partnership with uh, our Carteret County Reentry Council, um, you, you Empower You, and Sports. 24 sports uh, company. This, this flyer actually shows what we're dedicated to. It shows one side of an individual where he's incarcerated. The other side shows success. And what we're trying to do is actually empower individuals that are coming out of um, out of being incarcerated, which we call returning citizens. As Gordon Morton in Newport, he calls them our neighbors. Anytime you enter a room, enter a store, and you don't know everybody is in there, you do not know who is actually incarcerated. We are dedicated to the less successful outcomes, and we would like to continue to show the evidence-based practices how to create success with our citizens, create success with their families, and lower recidivism being safer community. Our upcoming reentry simulation event, we on who's going to be involved with it and actually speaking at this event, it's going to be our own uh, Senator L uh, Lazara. We also has gotten information from Congressman Murphy's office that he's going to be there, and also Todd Dixie, who's the Secretary of the Department of Adult Corrections. And also include that Bernie Lee, there's going to be other commissioners from Carteret County. Some of our commissioners from Oslo said that they would be involved. And I think Cindy Edwards uh, and also Bob Ward are at large council person. Next, I'm going to bring up Michael Moretti. He is the executive director of Human Power U. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you very much. I'm here also in Charlotte. Our experience up here, uh, first and foremost, has been an amazing one. To be together with 500 other individuals that are here for one reason, including the government. You know, I heard a saying today that America is a land of the second chance. And when the gates of the prison open, the path ahead, the path ahead should lead to a better life. George W. Bush said that. Today I had the opportunity to sit down with Todd Peach. Todd is the secretary of the newly established North Carolina Department of Adult Corrections. I had the opportunity to sit down with him because he asked because he had heard what we were already doing in Jacksonville specifically. And the strides that we have put in forward motion that we are working on to make a difference. We have been recognized at this conference by multiple individuals for the things we're doing. Specifically, this re-entry simulation. It is the first re-entry simulation ever held 
on the east coast of the state of North Carolina. The amount of people that are going to come to this is going to be impactful. For anyone that's ever gone through a reentry simulation, it's not only powerful, it be hurtful. I have found grown men even up here, and just recently today went through a simulation, drop because they didn't realize the barriers that are placed in front of our returning home citizens. <clears throat> this opportunity that we have in the city of Jackson is unique. It's unique because we've already created a mechanism in place to assist the people. You know, some of the things, almost nine months ago when the chief brought everybody together in a meeting, from that meeting, we have done something that the state has recognized. The state told us it would take 18 months. In nine months' time, if not only created a castle, not only created by the law, we have established memorandums of understanding with the Department of Public Safety, the House of Rayford, the City of Carteret County. We've also elected executives. We have created a fiduciary graciously with United Way. We have taken people to work, and more probably, we have worked with the nonprofit of Jackson. But we also need help for that simulation. <clears throat> I will tell you, first and foremost, my thanks go back to Chief Gennaro, because he assisted us not only in helping with the simulation, but also because of his leadership, and also for the very beginning of all this, for the first six months, he allowed us his executive uh, administrator, Mary Burroughs, and she made a difference in what we were doing. We now, because of the United Way, the United Way has hired someone part-time on behalf of the Tactical Onslow Welcome Home Council to work as our administrator. This is impactful. More importantly, I'd also like to take this time. I'd like to thank Councilwoman Cindy Williams because when we when we were looking at these things, Sydney Everett, I apologize. Sydney, you know, when I came to you with the process of thinking of what our logo should look like, you took my idea, created something wonderful and beautiful that you will see. You will see the tree with roots, the growth, the leaves that mean the new life that we are creating. We are in a position now to make a difference for people coming back. At this time, what I would like to do, I would like to introduce Ms. Sharon Pope. Sharon is part of You Empower You. She is the Executive Director of Strategic Planning of the Grant Writer, and her talents have already been used because she is writing grants for the Jacksonville Onslow Welcome Home Council, along with the Carteret Council. Sharon, if you don't mind, please, let's take it from here. Thank you very much. And I also would like to um, thank the council for allowing us to speak today and also to recognize what a uh, wonderful job that you guys do. You have lots of hard decisions. I don't think people realize as much. Uh, you have so many different uh, groups and, and projects that come to you needing funding and everyone is so worthy and doing a really good job. Uh, with what they're doing to try to make an impact in the community that it's a uh, really difficult um, position that you have to put yourself in to decide, you know, who gets funding, who doesn't. Uh, the Jacksonville Onslow Welcome Home Council, I will say that I have worked uh, in different capacities with reentry councils and understand the difficulty that it takes to establish them. Uh, I have to uh, applaud the entire um, Jacksonville Onslow Welcome Home Council for their diligent effort and the speed of which they put this council together and brought all of the stakeholders into the council and have so many different people working in different capacities. Uh, this shows a great commitment from the community uh, as well as the city. I know uh, Mike just mentioned you have had support from the um, uh, police department, the chief uh, and staff there to make this happen. So we're very uh, grateful for all of those assistance assistance that's been given because that's what makes uh, this move so quickly and has progressed so wonderfully since its inception. Uh, we just want to, I guess, get started with the uh, PowerPoint and basically say we wanted to uh, submit 
for this organizational overview for the city and the people of uh, Jacksonville to see kind of what we're doing um, to bring those that are transitioning back from incarceration back into the community. And we believe that every person has the potential to create their version of success. Um, and I'm, I'm going to about page four, if I can get um, the overview brought up. So what we're doing is um, the vision is to assist the men and women in transition from jail or prison back into the community. And this is accomplished through peer support, linkage to health and mental health care, employment, housing, basic needs, clothing, and other community resources. And they hope uh, the hope is to reduce recidiv the cycle of recidivism by working with one person at a time. Uh, we work hard to see a world where every person has the opportunity to live a happy, healthy, and productive life. Some of the proposed objectives of this include um, the commitment uh, to being the point of contact or a one-stop shop, if you will, for those that are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. Uh, currently, right now, according uh, to the Department of Public Safety, there's about 170 people which are released back into, that are projected to be released back into um, your area, Onslow, Jacksonville, between January 1st and December uh, 31st of this year. Uh, this does not include, and I think oftentimes it's often uh, forgotten, that every year your local jail has hundreds and thousands of people that are released, or not thousands, multiple thousands of people that are released that this uh, council can assist. So it's not just the ones returning from prison, but also those that you have uh, in that cycle of recidivism locally uh, in your jail. Providing assistance looks like uh, removing those barriers. And uh, as Mike mentioned, the simulation, and we would encourage everyone to attend, basically puts you in a position to walk as a person newly released from jail or prison and understand those barriers that people are faced with, such as getting an ID, uh, still struggling with a substance use disorder, getting that treatment, transportation, housing, employment, medical treatment, education, and of course their family reunification, and mental health and community support. Uh, we're looking to uh, continue to convene this, these stakeholder, stakeholders to offer assistance and resources and a commitment to assist those justice served and justice involved. Mike mentioned some of the accomplishments. Um, the, by the bylaws were written faster, uh, I think, than maybe anyone in the state ever anticipated. Um, even without a physical location, the council has been connecting individuals to resources and services. Currently, right now, there are uh, 50 people that are going to work every day. There has been 200 jobs secured uh, and guaranteed for anyone who is uh, in the community, whether they're on probation, they're just returning from prison, or just getting out of jail, they have a spot on this bus that they can get on and um, go to their employment. Uh, the ja Jacksonville also has welcomed, uh, has partnered with UN Power Youth Foundation as well as the Carteret County Reentry uh, Council to create those employment opportunities. Again, 200 jobs have been secured for those. Um, Jacksonville uh, Onslo is well, um, Council is working with the Jacksonville Transit Authority uh, to secure bus passes for those individuals who are newly released. And they are also working on an even greater project with the Carteret Correctional Center to actually secure a work release program for 40 additional men per day to work at the House of Races, <coughs> ensuring that economic <coughs> opportunities and the participants and filling the need of that employment in the community. We can go on to sort of the, uh, the pieces coming together in our budget request. Next yes. slide. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I think there's a delay on the internet, so I'm trying not to uh, to look at that. Um, <laughs> again, you guys have uh, the council has done a fantastic job of securing 106 volunteers that serve on the council. 31 agencies are represented and have pledged support. Uh, and in three months, they have uh, provided more than 50 individuals have been paired through the job 
uh, and trans stop program from transportation. The budget and PowerPoint that is up there, I do realize that there was an earlier version of the actual budget submitted, and so there are a couple of errors on there uh, that we can we can talk through that. Basically, what is being asked for for this, the state has uh, talked about and encouraged the council to uh, become active and, and, and brought it into being with the help of all of the volunteers and everyone. However, the process with the state is sort of at a standstill because the Department of uh, Adult Correction has now taken over uh, the reentry services from the Department of Public Safety. So that ha has been a transition period for the state. No new funding will actually be provided from uh, the state initially. There will have to be an application period. Uh, no one even knows exactly what the funding schedule is going to look like. Uh, it will not even be released until after the new fiscal year in July. So with knowing how it's a sort of a new program and some of the delays that sometimes happen at the state level and just the process of doing an application, the budget is requesting a program manager. Uh, this salary, as you can see, is very low. It is potentially going to be augmented through other sources. Um, there will be the, the most important component of this uh, as far as the personnel cost would include a full-time peer support person. Uh, the peer support mechanism, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with that, is going to be the glue that holds this whole program together. Being able to rely on someone uh, for guidance and help that is a peer, someone who has those same lived life experiences, that's an invaluable part of the program. Um, you know, other people can talk with someone and try to help, you know, and, and give direction. But when they have that person that has, has basically walked in the same path that they are walking now and understand the trials and um, <coughs> barriers that they're going to encounter, it is invaluable. So we're looking to uh, do contracted peer support uh, for a full-time position each year. Housing is one of the most um, greatest or the greatest challenge that someone, return, a returning uh, citizen, is going to face. There uh, is a request for up to $45,000 to assist with housing costs. This would be, uh, might be a one-time stipend of uh, a first month, month rent, uh, a security deposit, those things that they are unable to pay uh, just being released uh, from jail or prison. Uh, employment transportation costs, uh, general transportation for the, um, the bus that would be, that is uh, tr in transit right now every day, uh, also transporting those that are recently released. This would not include those that are in the prison. That is a separate a separate program. Uh, emergency medicine until when a person is released and they have these um, needs and they're newly released from prison, there is a period of time that they could be without certain, say, mental health drugs or other things that would, um, you know, impact their health. So we would certainly want to make sure that they were able to get those on a very limited basis until they could be connected with resources. And then other potentially miscellaneous uh, costs. Uh, the equipment and supplies would be very meager uh, for the program, just uh, one laptop. Again, you may be seeing an old version. I'm going to give you the correct version. Uh, a, la you know, a laptop for a peer support specialist, um, email services for the board and any of the staff, website hosting, uh, one, one year of cell phone service for the peer support person, the local travel of the peer support. Uh, printing and brochures and handouts, these would be to get the word out and especially providing a method of doing uh, recruitment to those that may be incarcerated locally inside the jail. So making sure uh, a partnership uh, is solidified and, and uh, enhanced with the sheriff's office so that the folks in the jail get this information so they know that when they're released they have somewhere to go. Uh, and, of course, liability insurance. You'll notice there are not any costs for a physical location. Uh, we are trying diligently to work on getting that provided uh, either through another nonprofit or through another means. So it is a, a uh, rather 
lean budget when it comes to things that are not related to direct service. There was a uh, uh, the grant writer uh, contracted position there. Um, I will let you know I am aggressively looking for grants for this program. Uh, I have a meeting actually tomorrow with the United Way, the folks at the United Way for us to strategize and come up with uh, additional ways. Um, the state money when it comes through is for a, it, it is basically a seed program and you know we have to be able, you have to have an aggressive method to try to not always come to the city and the county with your hands out. So we will be looking for uh, other avenues, grant funding, whether it be uh, things like the Second Chance Act, there's a community-based re-entry grant uh, to other uh, grants that are available nationally, locally, uh, and then pri private foundation funds that could potentially be available as well. Mike, I guess I'll turn the rest of it back over to you. Thanks, John. Um, I, I'd like to announce tonight, actually, that um, in the collaboration with the uh, Carter Rec Council, we just recently received word that we received a grant for $96,000. That grant is uh, in the hands of Carter Rec County currently. We're working in conjunction with the um, Carter Rock County Community College and also NC Works. That grant is specific to, uh, it's going to allow us, we knew from the beginning we were going to need more than one peer support. That grant is going to give us second peer support that we're going to need. <clears throat> the grant is for two years, so we have coverage for a peer support for that time. And that's pretty, pretty tight. For being only doing this for nine months, to get a grant is impressive in what we've been able to accomplish. The other thing I'd be able to tell you is that uh, we do have a house to put Jack on the welcome home capital in. We have uh, working with Cavalry Chapel, both of uh, <clears throat> Henderson Air and the shopping center. Uh, Pastor Ricky is putting an office in for us right there. Um, we're working directly with DPS, where an individual that comes back from the prison environment they have 72 hours to report to the probation officer. Then they have 72 hours if they're coming back to Gaffordville to report to the council here. Because one thing they don't need is work. One thing we have for them is we have 200 jobs. They all have a job in the next year. One thing is I think it's important for you to recognize. Even though we're looking for a sum of money of $156,000, with 50 individuals going to work at the House of Rayford at their current rate of pay, that's a give back of $1.7 million. In other words, the average pay is $34,000 a year. Of those 50 individuals that are working, every one of them lives within the city limits of Jacksonville. That means that's $1.7 million of the economic growth within the city. Because now we have those individuals paying rent, mortgages, paying, buying their groceries. So it's not just about what the money helps us to do, it's about what we're doing with them. All right? And with the additional jobs that we have, double that number within a year with 200 people going to work. And that is because of the commitment that we have from the Department of Public Safety right there on our program. So, if you have any questions, be more than happy to ask them, answer them for you. Council? No. Council, have any questions? Okay, we'll, we'll get ready to close out. I would also, again, like to thank Chief, thank Chief Lugionero, who actually brought this me several years back about restarting another uh, reentry council. Also, a young man by the name of J.B. Sloan stopped me at, in front of the city council for my second meeting, I think, and said, what am I going to do about reentry? So we are working to try to make uh, a successful reentry program. And uh, I thank you all for helping us out. I also thank you, thank all the community partners for assisting in this process and our, our continued growth. Also, any organization that would like to get in contact with us mm -hmm. to be involved. And we also, we're always looking for others to get involved based on what their ministries are or what the organizations are already doing. We're not trying
trying to reinvent any wheels here. We're just trying to make sure it keeps rolling. Anyway, good night, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity. Thank you. Have a good thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Point of clarification. Yes. Just to put it on the record, um, the logo services were a donation from me privately to the organization. They're not a client in the company, so no dollars exchange hands there. Just like thank you for coming. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. What do you do for the Okay. Moving forward, we don't have Plays in you know, public safety and you're the big bad or the restaurant. Oh, yeah. That's how you want to look at it. This is so good. Too many versions Oh, no, no. You get to keep it. Oh, you taking this one back? No, man, you get to keep both of them. Oh, I like the uh, one yeah, part of the yeah, yeah. Another yeah, door stop. There's got one. There's got one. Yeah. There you go. Thank you very much, sir. I'll take one. <laughs> that would have been the best. That would have been the best. Well, I'm going to basketball. It really is more blessed. From here, there was no one. You got another person to give that you can give to. Yeah, I can see why. I'm so happy. Yeah. Okay, Mom, look away. I have one you can use. Uh, uh, Save some money. Some traffic coming right there. <laughs> Next, huh? Yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor Council. I know you've had a long evening, so I'll try not to, I'll try to be brief, right? Ooh, yeah. I'll try not to leave you this on. But, you know, the manager just passed out the draft capital improvement plan for fiscal year 24 to 33. Um, so tonight, what I'll do is kind of hit the highlights. Um, I know you just gotten it. I think it was. Um, uploaded last week digitally as well, so whichever you prefer. Um, if you have any questions, please send them back to the manager. We'll be happy to um, answer any questions or, or um, supply additional information. So tonight what I'll do is give you a brief overview, talk about the projects that we're wrapping up, um, the, I'll focus on the FY24 projects, and then we'll kind of give you a summary for uh, each of the departments. Just as a reminder, I know that we do this every year, but the capital improvement plan is a 10 year uh, planning horizon. Um, it covers all of the capital projects that we plan for in the city. Um, we update it and review it annually. Uh, we plan and prioritize projects um, and, and program those projects in the appropriate year. And then we use this document, especially on the water and sewer side, for um, evaluating our water and sewer rates as part of our rate model, which Sabrina is going to talk to you about tonight. And then we use it to calculate our system development fees, which has to be done every five years. And uh, the general statute requires a 10 year planning window. So, um, and lastly, while it's a 10 year plan, only the first year is funded, and typically you adopt that as part of your budget. To be a capital improvement plan project, it has to be basically a construction type project. Uh, we don't we don't add equipment <coughs> or you know backhoes or trucks or fire trucks or ladder trucks or anything like that into the capital improvement plan. This really is project driven. Um, the project typically takes twelve months to design and construct or longer. Uh, it has a useful life of five years and typically exceeds $50,000. There may be one or two exemptions in there. Uh, for example, Sturgeon City Boardwalk. Um, if you look at the whole program, it's a replacement program. So we add a little bit of money each year. So that year may not be $50,000, but if you total the whole project up, it exceeds the $50,000. And then the typical types of projects are either um, rehabilitation, new construction, um, 
growth related replacement or just general improvement projects. So with your capital improvement plan, the 10 year window has 128 projects totaling approximately $171 million. Um, each of those projects are tied back to your council adopted goals. Um, and the ones that are kind of addressed by your capital improvement program are circled there around um, the slide. Uh, it has various funding sources. Um, as you can imagine, it's not funded by just the general fund or just water and sewer. Um, so we have various funding sources included donations from, or, or donations, I guess is the wrong word, but contributions from like Council County. Um, we have grant funding. We have, um, as you can see, the revenue bonds and the water and sewer are all water and sewer related projects. So that is more, that's about 53% of your total funding for the 10 year plan. So more than half of this is your water and sewer um, side of um, the, the plan. And then you also have some general fund and your installment purchase, which is funded by general fund and your capital reserve. And um, from capital reserve, it's typically about one point or it's around $1.8 million this year. And the POW bill, which is where we do our street and sidewalks, uh, is about 1.7, half of, just over half of that goes into the capital plan each year for funding. Um, the rest of that goes into the streets maintenance budget, but anything not used in the streets maintenance budget then rolls back into the capital improvement plan the next year. So with that, we have um, several projects that will be completed in FY23 or the beginning part of FY24. I won't go through each of those individually. Um, the one on this slide I'd really like to talk about a little bit is the Brookview infrastructure. As you'll recall, we had a major um, sewer main failure there. We had to replace the sewer main, which precipitated replacing the water main. We have that done. We've repaved um, the patch, which is what was disturbed. Uh, the, that street will be milled and overlaid this summer with the street paving project. So kind of wanted to highlight while the infrastructure piece of that project is done, we will come back and get the street this summer with our next street paving. And then uh, one last one on that one, the FY20 line water run, line replacement. We actually just um, installed a new water line up Richards Drive to uh, provide better fire support for Oslo County um, or Oslo Community Ministries uh, and a, a little church that's right there on Richards Drive. So that project's wrapped up and we'll hopefully have that line in service very soon. And then, of course, the biggest one on this one is obviously Jack Amiet. So we have that project um, pretty much wrapped up in operation and um, we'll be closing everything out there and entering our warranty period. So for FY24, you'll notice that we have 41 total projects across all of the departments for the entire plan. I already mentioned we have 128. Of the 41, 29 already have funding, so they're rolling over. From prior years, a great example would be the Parkwood Regional uh, Sewer System that we've been talking about for probably the last 10. Um, that project's actually out to bid, and we expect to get bids back in May. May, May 3rd. May 3rd. Um, so with that, really only 12 projects are new to FY24. Um, or, or new for funding in FY24. And there you can see the breakout of the projects by department. You'll notice that the uh, public services department has the lion, lion's share of those projects. The reason is a large portion of those are water and sewer, which was indicated by um, the funding sources. And then we're kind of the catch-all for everything else. So that would be streets and sidewalks and stormwater. But then if there's anything general like parking lot repaving or um, upgrades to existing facilities that are specific to, you know, a fire station or something like that, those would all fall into public service. <clears throat> For public safety, they have one project in FY24, that is Fire Station 4. You all know that's previously funded because you were all pretty much at the groundbreaking ceremony. Um, that project's moving along nicely, um, and I think we'll have a very nice fire station. 
And you can see that what we've tried to do is tie the goals that the, um, that the projects um, touch back in on each slide. So you'll notice that that one not only touches quality of life for our citizens because of response times and those kind of things, but also for our um, workforce and for our public safety people. Um, in recreation and parks, we have seven projects proposed for FY24. Um, the one on this slide that doesn't have prior funding is Kerr Street Fishing Pier. That appears to have been there for a while and we need to do some work to it. So this will be um, an investment in that pier and replacing some of the boards and supports along with that pier. Um, on this slide, I think you're familiar with the Miracle Meadow, I mean Miracle Field um, project. We received grant funding. So if you approve the uh, capital plan as proposed with this project, then funding would become available July 1st and we can move forward with the grant that we received. Well, like, while you're on recreation, why are you still showing 500 some thousand for Jack Amy and for Paris for this year's budget, coming budget? I'll have to check. It may be that we just hadn't expended all the funds yet. So um, let me, I'll, I'll have Randall look that up while I'm talking. I was just looking at it in terms of the regular budget general fund. Page 12 shows 500. Yeah, that's a joke. 5,290,000. Can you give me the page number? Page 12. Page 12. Okay. I'll have Randall look that up while we're... Okay. And then um, also on this side is the um, crossings at the park behind Williamsburg Plantation. You'll notice in the capital improvement plan, there is not a, a project for the overall facility itself. Um, and the reason for that is Anthony has led us through the selection process um, for a design team. And um, once we have that master plan completed, then we'll appropriately program um, that project in. Mr. Hanson, remind us again where Miracle Field is located. The Miracle Field, they're looking at the old skate park in the Commons, is that location. That's right. okay. For transportation services, we have 10 projects. Um, on those projects, uh, they're primarily, we do have one trail project, the downtown trail project that's completely designed and um, I believe it's actually been awarded. I don't see Anthony, but so um, that project will be moving forward. And then we have several intersection and signal improvements. And then we have a couple of projects like the ADA projects and the fiber project. There are ongoing programs that reoccur um, each year or every few years. So while those uh, bottom ones have those bottom few projects, um, have new funding, they are reoccurring programs that the city typically invests in each year. And then for public services, we have a total of 23 projects for this year. You'll notice between water projects, sewer projects, and combined infrastructure, which is really water and sewer and typically street, um, the bulk of those projects are more than half of the total projects for public services. So moving into those, you'll see that Newbridge infrastructure will carry on because that is an 18 month project. Uh, I already talked about the Parkwood Regional or Western Regional um, sewer system. That project will be, uh, will receive bids for, on May 3rd for that. Um, and then we have uh, several other projects up there um, that are really rolling over their prior funded um, either design is completed or in process now so that we can move forward with construction. Um, really the only project that I can think of um, that is a new project, really is not a new project, it's the Drummer Kellum, and didn't make this list, I apologize, it's the one that I realized I left off, but it's the Drummer Kellum Water and Sewer Extension. There was a piece of property that was bought across from Stevenson Toyota on 17, 
by Mr. Brown. And we agreed that if he would annex that property, we would extend water and sewer from the um, southern side of 17, where Toyota is, over to his property, and then he would be responsible for extending it out into his property. But the city would recover our cost through our system development fees. So we would do it through our um, water and sewer service area. So um, that project is in your book this year. It is proposed for this year. Um, Tidewater and Associates contacted us saying that they were interested in moving forward. The design is completed. It completed. We completed that design and actually had it permitted when the property was annexed back in 2016 or 17. But with most projects like this, we don't typically move forward until the developer begins to move forward. So that project's ready to go. We just need funding. And then the other projects um, that are new funding this year are our how our ongoing projects, like our street paving and then our pedestrian and, and ADA improvements. So in summary, um, again, only the FY24 projects are funded. The um, 25, FY25 through 33 projects are there for planning and programming, um, but they are not funding funded as part of the budget. Um, again, we try to tie each of the projects that we propose to your council goals and initiatives. And... Um, at least for the water and sewer projects, they are all covered in the water and sewer model that Sabrina is going to speak with you about. And to, did you look up Jackie and Yeah, we should be closing it out this year. That's yeah, probably what it says, that we will be closing it out, sir. Yeah, that's so, just the project yeah, date we, budget. It's, there's no additional funding this year. Hmm. We have much work left on it. No, no, we don't do not have hardly anything left in that account. Okay. It's zero yeah. out. Oh, you were on page twelve on the. Yeah, I was. Shows an envelope. Twenty three and twenty. This school year, twenty twenty one capital project summary page twelve. I think it's just because that's a open project and we'll end up closing out and I'm assuming that that's what's the budget to date columns? Yeah, budget to date is the five point three three nine million. Yeah. And that's just that's the total because it's wrapped up this year in the FY. Yeah, there's hardly anything left in that. I think maybe for man to finish there might have been fifteen, twenty thousand. There is not a lot whatsoever. Yeah. We just had a meeting. <laughs> I don't have it on this page, Mr. Bitt. I'm just, I may be looking on the wrong page, so I have to look at it. With the you. center column is additional funding. The column to the right is just the project to date budget, which would be the total until it's closed. So it's not being, so be it's not being added to 24 again. It's just, that's the budget total sitting there until it's. Okay. Zero out, right? Yeah, they just show up and until we close them out, they stay on the project. So, I right. see. Okay. So that, that's my thirty thousand view foot view of the capital improvement program. If you have any questions, um, please send them to Mr. Ray. We will try to get those answered for you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sabrina to talk about the financing fees. That was the fastest CP presentation. I'm oh, trying to keep it short. <laughs> so, as Molly said, we usually do present the water sewer rate model with the CIP because half of the funding in the CIP is related to the water sewer, and we want to be sure that we have sufficient rates for that. So, our, our rate model is a financial planning tool that we use to determine if our rates are sufficient to cover any CIP projects that we have for the next few years. Um, it also helps us monitor our fund balance to make sure that we're keeping the fund balance at the level that we set when we first had the model data. And it also um, ensures that we're meeting our debt compensation that we have to have for our revenue. 
while we're putting together the model, we do make um, some assumptions. We have our FY23 expenditures that we estimate um, for that one budget at 17.9 million. And then we enter all of our FY23 expenditures that we have as of right now at um, 17.5. We estimate expense escalations between 1.5% and 4%, depending on the category. Um, everything from salaries to utilities to construction. The CIP projects does account for some installation lengths as well. And this year, we will um, be wanting to see an increase in the meter count due to our GPA gets in the town standard because we want to make sure that we account for the guys. Um, so it's a nice ability. We are still um, at the end of the last year, we have our really such growth detected at zero. Percent um, that's not on full meters, much as current usage as we see the people still continue to use our We have all of the proposed LP projects, like the new proposed LP, which are in the next year called 33. And we still have the 29 million dollars in saying that all of the money um, is not a part of the original project anymore. And this is just a clarification. <laughs> You can see that for 23, um, there's a case law that we're going to increase from the estimate that we have to set up. Our usage is really about the same, and our revenue is pretty close to the end of the And that's just projected to be another thing in the year. And when we talk about meters here, we don't necessarily mean the last year actually refer to meters. We use our quote on residential meters. We have a ratio here. We have all the time units. Of the for the and then we have a small increase to reflect a new river, and so our use for the is pretty close to the same as we're being in the watch for me today. And before you get to the show, if you're on the green block layer, you can see there will be a water in the sewer, separate from the top of the line, and then it will be the same all three. And then that will be the ground, so we will have our state schools and gallons, um, because that's just more of what we look at, and then our other people as well, for the customer to get used to the 2000, yes, the 2000. But this line is the, what we call the just in town rate increases. So, if you were to monitor in rate of these all, it just let us see calculate the rates. That's the rate so that we can use so it's the same to fund the franchise to keep our payment that's at above the trigger to meet our debt service questionnaires. Um, if you recall that in the past we tried to avoid years of long rate increase and then all of a sudden we had a little team except we had to that to get those point dollars to increases. So that is now to maybe two hundred and thirty percent each year and that will keep us from having to do those large rate increases and go third point three two. And you can see in twenty thirty this um US dollars. Yeah. Or we can get to one of the nails and thirty one and thirty two those are the big more business. And if you notice the act that we're sort of on to meet get to those wild years if you meant to do the point five percent in increase, you end up with one of seven sixty probably or the end for sort of the law that you um only do with the system, you know, the just in time rate was one, you end up with the one hundred and twenty thousand in our value. Any questions on that? Thank you. Um, as we move forward, we have a conversation with the budget, and the CIP has adopted general 
watch it. Like, which was great because we want to go to the Sabrina and Wally is watching them go through this model and to be able to update it. The point that Sabrina's making there too is getting the full rate structure in over the 10 year period allows us not to have that big wow factor. You know, a lot of times we pull up that minimum bill. So if you're talking to citizens, we want to be able to show what the difference is with the average water and sewer bill, which may be my household that has four or five or who knows how many people in it. And then the minimum bill, which could be a one, two, maybe even a three person home. So when you're looking at those numbers, we, we always want to compare, which is great that they added this in this model, the minimum bill versus the average bill, because we constantly look at how do we impact the lower user of water and wastewater. And that number is not in FY 2032, it's not 107.63, that number 66.85. So as you're thinking about that over time, just want to remember to shape that narrative for our different types of households so everyone understands the different impacts of what that 2.25 means exponentially um, year after year. For, for most of you, you've seen this year after year. For a couple of us, we've just now seen this model. And I just, I say that um, Wally and Sabrina do an excellent job of managing the projections to satisfy the goal of not having the one big wham impact because you could have that fluctuation of no increase, no increase, 1.9% increase, but then on the back end, you're going to catch 17.61%. And we all know there's not a year where we ever think 17.61% is doable. And, and the easiest way to think about that is your gas price. We always say if we could just manage our gasoline prices over time, it'd be easier for us to handle it instead of ebb and flow. And this model allows us to... Uh, to utilize that over time. And you'll see on the fund balance for water and wastewater that it looks great, but as soon as we knock out the one large project and then consistently hit every one of those, they don't have small projects in water and wastewater. Small projects, five million typically in water and wastewater. And so you see that down and for us to maintain that point, um, it it's, takes effort and it takes knowledge of understanding the full capital improvement plan to be able to maintain the model over time. And I think that's the value when we talk to different groups of citizens, being able to explain that to them so they can see that explanation is a, is a value. And so, um, I, I, I wouldn't think citizens would ever come in to see the rate model, but you can, I know, that would be crazy, but you could carry that message of what we're trying to do over the 10 year period um, pretty effectively to them just with the slides that, that Sabrina's given us. Just to make a comment on fund balance, we end up, you know, when we do borrow them, you know, it's more than likely we will be repaying ourselves. So when we award the contract, what we're doing is temporarily using fund balance to be able to award the contract, you know, and, and so what we're doing is self-financing for a period of time. So if you don't have that fund balance, you can't award the contract. You know, so, uh, you know, I mean, there's a need for some of this fund balance when people really, you know, look at and say, why are you doing that? Well, that's part of how we manage our business operations. Thanks, Mary. One last thing on the budget. Uh, Four cent council initiative. Have you got anything in our budget worked out Oops. to give us an update for Red on that? On what it's worth? Uh, well, what, what, what's committed and what's available each year and <clears throat> when those commitments run out? Left in, in the can, we, can we get that? Yes. You know, and to me, it would make good sense to put that right in the budget along with the. Uh, 
it's a fund balance, you know, signed fund balance. For, so just, you know, just as a general information tip. I do want to say in comment, I think tonight, uh, Wally and Sabrina's presentation is, is phenomenal. And I think that the presentations we've had from the community are exciting. Mr. Ward and I were talking in the break here that it's exciting to see community partners making things happen. It's like Mr. Sosa said, these projects are going to move forward one way or the other. You know, whether the city's a partner or not, the community is going to figure out how to make things happen. And it's, it's great to be a partner at the table to provide whatever level of support we can. A lot of these things, it may be staff support that we can provide, it may be council support, but to hear the energy based on the total number of projects that we have in the CIP, that the community's pushing out, seeing new businesses open, seeing houses being built, it shows some vibrancy and it's, it's very exciting. And then the other comment I will make is, uh, Mary, you may have noticed that Rose is not here this evening. You may not have noticed that either, but uh, I know it seems seamless, but I do want to say uh, Rose is recovering well and we, uh, we miss her and we, um, uh, we keep her in our thoughts and our prayers. But Alexis, we have run her through the ringer this week to get an agenda together and thrown stuff in last day and the day before and on Sunday. And it's been great. So uh, it's a great start to our one city moment here. Did you want to present this? No, no, no. Okay, I was just checking. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to miss up Thank the opportunity. So the, the Girl Scouts troop uh, got to come this week. It's actually Pine Girl Scout Troop 409. Uh, they did something that's really fun is they came into the council chambers and they sat in your seats. And in your seats, um, you, most of your seats are fun and all, but the mayor's has a gavel. And so they got to cycle through with a gavel. And part of that process was they banged the gavel and made some quotes. A few of their quotes, these are incredible. The first one was, I'm guilty. I'm not going to tell you which kid that was. <laughs> my kids are not up there, thank heavens. Um, the, the second was, my sister cannot have any more cookies. I thought that was pretty good. Um, my third was, my mom's going to give me another sister. So I don't know what kind of gavel you have, Mayor, but if it's that powerful, it's please powerful. get rid of it. Um, one, their family's going to move to Florida. So we're going to miss that kid when they gaveled it. Um, and then the last one, really powerful, keep the gavel away from our house. We're going to get a new puppy. So uh, you, you look through this, and I don't know how you can tell those faces no whatsoever. Then they so got this was a brownie troop. Or this was yes, sir. Uh, Coastal Pines Girl Scout Troop 409. Um, then they got to go in to see Alan, and and I don't think Josh did anything, but he was sitting there with Alan <laughs> while they're all pointing to the screen. Uh, but they got to tour there. And they got to see how the control room works, and they moved the cameras, which well, they look like they're in awe of whatever it is they're watching. So it must not be a replay of a council. <laughs> <laughs> must be the mayor up there with the cameras. Um, it was a budget meeting. That's right. Yeah. They're, they did a great job. Two of the uh, two of the girls they uh, completed projects, and they were able to earn their democracy badge. So that's the whole part of these programs: is that you're doing service projects so that you get additional badges to rock with these awesome outfits that they're wearing. And thank you to everybody that participated in, in that evening, which was, um, which was awesome. Um, this is, again, it's just great pictures. It makes you worry about the other pictures we're gonna share because it's hard to beat this. But we did have our extravaganza egg hunt that happened at the Commons and just a ton of kids out and about. And the Easter Bunny showed up to uh, make an appearance this is the fun stuff that we do all the time. We utilize multiple field spaces for these hunts. Again, we, we have kids in different areas so that we uh, focus energies and efforts so that the older kids, as we heard earlier, do not steal from the younger kids to take out the Easter Bunny. But this is the effectiveness of what we do at the city with, with these programs. Um, super exciting and a great job by uh, Susan's team and everybody that was that was working here at that. Uh, this is an awesome story. Most of you already know that uh, that Christina Cook is a local and an amazing astronaut. So already in the record books, you may have seen her come up on the news this last week. Um, I'm probably the least educated out of the group here, but I do know she's a White Oak High School alum, 
And in the Children's Museum downtown, they have a, a nice little display about her. Um, not only is she the um, world record holder for the longest space flight by a woman, she's getting ready to uh, sit on um, Artemis II mission to be the first woman to fly around the moon. Nice. which is incredible. So where'd she go to college? Uh, she went to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she skipped college. She's so smart. She sailed through. I think she attended the uh, great university in Raleigh, North Carolina. I believe she's an NC State graduate. And we are proud as to be to have her represented on our team, not because of what she's going to do, but because of what she's already done and the possibilities that she opens up for people that I think I read she attended space camp five years in a row and now she's flying around the moon. Uh, it shows that a college education doesn't necessarily hold you back. It doesn't matter, <laughs> does it? You can do things to overcome your educational levels. <laughs> she didn't go to Duke. <laughs> you misunderstood. 328 days in space already, and she's part of this next program that she's scheduled to go out again and potentially could have additional um i you know i can't wait till after this that when she comes back home if we can appreciate that as well I I guess guess rumor has still nick lanier was her mentor <laughs> <laughs> i guess her parents still live here dr hammer her, her father is here her mother beside you okay gotcha. well very excited and i it, we'd be remiss if we did not add this to the to the mix today well um, raleigh kind of stepped up the first time when she did her did her time in space and claimed her as their child you know mm -hmm. of course you know, she was because she was going to NC State. She mm -hmm. gone to NC State, so they stepped up first and grabbed the, the spotlight off the Jackson. We'll reclaim that, Mayor. <laughs> There's nothing that Raleigh can do that we can't do better. So exactly. we'll, we'll get Lisa rolling, and we'll get some press out here. Um, uh, this is real cool. So this is the Joint Community Community Cleanup, and so we had the Jacksonville Youth Council, we had the Environmental Appearance Council, um, and we had multiple team members here as you can see pictured, um, which is great because we're getting out, and this is the area in and around uh, behind altitude. So this was a cleanup today, which is impressive because you may recognize some of these faces here today that have, Please don't. That have <laughs> you may not recognize some, they might be like incognito, but they made it out today to make things happen and to clean up an area and to have multiple entities. The, the fact is it's not just one group doing the work, it's, it's called joint committee for a reason because we have multiple people out and about um, in, the, in the activity today. One of the more impressive things today is one of our volunteers fell down, had an accident, and our resident um, nurse on call, Dr. Washington, responded to this event. And, and this is something crazy. You can't pick these things because a lot of times we have accidents. You don't have someone that's trained to respond right there next to them. We were caught, we rely on our public safety services to respond. But word on the street is Dr. Washington was there and was able to effectively manage uh, this injury and to assist in the process to calm down one of our volunteers and to assist them to get uh, the response that they needed. And I think that's, that's beyond impressive. I was telling Dr. Washington, not only did she do that and cleaned up, she then came to the meeting and doesn't look like she was out in the cleanup today. Um, I think there's a value there and that's going above and beyond. So Mary, when we talk about the one city moment, there's so multiple things going on here today that were impressive. Uh, but with, uh, with our team here, multiple members of our team, and then Dr. Washington taking it to another level, we see something that, uh, that could have been a, a much worse situation that was handled effectively. That's a value add, I call Mayor, I was somewhere here. I don't know if I didn't make it in the picture, but I think I was somewhere there cleaning up as well. So maybe behind that. I've got to be in. I got to be in one of these pictures. Uh, hold on a second. I got to be in. Oh man, they must not have got me. Josh typically misses out. Yeah, I think I was in that car. What you should have said, you were behind the camera. <laughs> That's right. I was way behind. We had enough representation there today from from these guys that we did an awesome job. And I think that's part of it. It ties in perfectly with the presentations you heard tonight, Mayor. And this is, these things are all awesome uh, one city moments that give us a lot of pride. Thank you very much. Anybody else have anything before we adjourn? Okay.
I think that's my second stepping in council RN role since I did. Yeah. I need pay raise. Yeah, I need a new job We don't have the money and we don't have the money. Oh, money. Oh, yes, we do. Stay close by, Dr. Washington. You face that same That unrestricted well balance. Mind. So we need to have a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Okay, you got a second. Okay.